Hello and welcome to Asia Newsweek. I'm Yvonne Yong. Over the next half hour, we'll cover the big news stories making headlines in Asia this week and bring you some unique stories you may have missed. Our top story. Typhoon Gami has made landfall in the southeastern coast of China after pounding Taiwan and flooding the Philippines. Across the region, the deadly typhoon has caused landslides, blackouts and displaced hundreds of thousands of people. And there's major concern off the coast of the Philippines as authorities attempt to contain an oil spill caused by a fuel tanker which sank during the severe storm. East Asia correspondent Kathleen Calderwood has more from Taipei. Urgent efforts are underway to contain an enormous oil spill in the Philippines after a fuel tanker sunk in rough conditions following Typhoon Gami. Now, the Transportation Secretary in the Philippines says that 16 of the 17 crew members on that ship were rescued, but sadly the 17th member died. There was nearly 1,500 metric tonnes of industrial fuel on that ship, according to the Philippine authorities. Of course, they are trying to contain that oil spill. It's now some kilometres long, but those efforts are being hampered by the difficult conditions. Now, Typhoon Gami really has left a path of destruction through East Asia. It didn't even make landfall in the Philippines, yet it brought an enormous amount of rain to the country. Manila and the areas around it in particular have been badly flooded, hundreds of thousands of people displaced, and the images uh, coming out of, out of the Philippines showing people wading through waist-deep, even neck-deep high uh, flood waters in some places and others where the water has receded. We can see people cleaning up just huge amounts of mud through streets and homes, entire households of belongings left unsalvageable. It moved on to Taiwan where it too brought an enormous amount of rain. There, are, there was more than a thousand mils, 1200 mils of rain in some parts of southern Taiwan in particular on Thursday. So severe flooding in some parts of southern Taiwan as well. There was a search and rescue ongoing for a freighter that was reported missing on Thursday morning. It was last heard from around 6.30 a.m. on Thursday. Uh, they reported in saying the ship that was the ship was listing and sinking. Uh, there are nine Myanmar nationals on board. A Taiwanese cargo ship ha was in the area a couple of hours later, but couldn't find it due to the poor visibility. And a Black Hawk rescue helicopter was dispatched to the area on Thursday afternoon. Several other ships have also been grounded in the conditions around Taiwan. Authorities saying that those crews are safe. Now, after passing over Taiwan, the typhoon moved on to China's southeastern coast. China has already had an awful summer of heavy rain and flooding, particularly in the last week. Uh, there has been significant flash flooding in various areas around China. So in the southeastern parts of China, we saw authorities stopping ferry services, stopping public transport, closing schools and tourist spots and really hunkering down as the typhoon arrived in southeastern China. In Bangladesh, what began as a student protest over a quota system in government jobs rapidly escalated into a nationwide uprising. Although tensions have eased after a ruling by the country's Supreme Court, the violence and deaths have left the country shaken. South Asia correspondent Meghna Bali reports. Bangladesh's Supreme Court has ruled to scale back a controversial government job quota system that has triggered weeks of student protests across the country. Now, these demonstrations turned violent in recent days, with outlets like the AFP reporting that more than 150 people have been killed. Now, before the internet was shut down last Thursday, social media was flooded with disturbing videos of dead and injured students, arson attacks, and police firing rubber bullets and smoke grenades. We've seen videos of migrants waiting outside airline offices trying to get out of the country. 
India has recorded nearly a thousand of its own students in the last few days. The protesters were demanding an end to a quota system that allocated more than 50% of all government jobs to special groups, including the families of those who fought for Bangladesh's independence from Pakistan in 1971. Now, this quota system was halted previously in 2018 following mass protests, but in June, Bangladesh's High Court reinstated them, setting off these fresh protests. Now, students are frustrated by shortages of good jobs, and they say that this system favours the ruling party and their supporters. But yesterday, the Supreme Court ordered that 93% of all government jobs had to go to candidates on merit, leaving just 7% for the quota system. But with comms down and a curfew in place, it's hard to know whether this decision has satisfied protesters or not. Well, for more on this, reporter Hannah Joes joins us now. Hannah, there have been media blackouts in Bangladesh, but you've managed to talk to some of these student protesters. What have they told you? Yes, Yvonne. So I managed to talk to some of them um, just before the blackout went into force, um, just as it was going to force, and then patchily in between as they were able to get connection, which was not, which was not very much. However, I was able to speak to them and they were able to get messages across saying that they are worried they were worried about retribution about their real names and locations being revealed in the media so that is the atmosphere of fear among the students there and we had you know a dozen or more people write into us asking for help from international media asking for help from the UN and they're claiming that government backed groups within universities have been attacking student protesters with bamboo sticks and other sharp objects and you know, some of these government supporting groups are made up of students. So in many cases, it was a case of students attacking each other. And so I was able to get on a video call with one of these protesters and I was able to see as he and fellow protesters went through their university trying to root out these attackers and prevent them from attacking them again. So you've had these conflagrations in the university campuses and military and police also in clashes with protesters um, you know, gov the government obviously blames the opposition for fomenting these protests, saying it was opposition supporters who first started the violence by committing arson and compelled the government to respond. But, you know, 180 people now have been killed. Reports are saying 1,200 arrested and thousands and thousands injured in the clashes. And we've been sent some videos from people's phones showing quite gruesome, quite grievous and life-threatening injuries. So this is quite a serious episode of unrest and of course now the curfew is starting to be eased shops are reopening and broadband internet is back but not mobile yet so we still haven't been able to re-establish that contact with the people that we were speaking to before or during the blackout and hannah it's clear this issue is becoming global with protests in solidarity with these students for examples in countries such as india japan australia as well yeah, we've had um, student protests in Melbourne um, from uh, spoken to the organisers of some of those. Their Bangladeshi students concerned about, you know, their loved ones, their friends, their fellow students back home. And some of these organisers have also, they know that some of their friends who've been injured in these clashes, they know, you know, some people who have been killed. So it is quite a personal issue for these students here in, in Australia and other countries. And India, of course, has very strong ties with Bangladesh being just across the border. The Indian state of West Bengal saw a lot of protests as it's just across. So people to people ties there are what is, um, you know, encouraging these protests in solidarity. So the Bangladeshi diaspora in different countries kind of really making their voices heard on this issue, backing the protesters. And they do ultimately agree with the larger aim of the protest, which is against that quota system. Um, so, yeah, that, that a lot of that frustration from Bangladeshi students in other countries. They've been very proactive on this issue. Hannah, thank you. Thank you. In Nepal, 18 people have died after a small plane crashed after takeoff in Kathmandu. One pilot survived. Footage shows the plane hitting the ground and erupting into a fireball. It's believed two crew members and 17 airline technicians were en route to a nearby city for maintenance checks when the crash occurred. The airport, located inside a valley, is known to be difficult for pilots to land at. Well, Thailand says it will not recriminalise cannabis as a narcotic and will work towards legislating it for medicinal use. 
In 2022, Thailand became one of the first countries in Asia to decriminalise marijuana, but without laws or regulations in place preventing its recreational use. Well, this saw a spike in recreational users as well as cafes and retailers enabling it, prompting public concern about its possible abuse. Still to come on Asian Newsweek, the secrets of omu rice with celebrity chef Kichi Kichi. Now, last Friday's crowd strike IT meltdown caused disarray across the globe. Flights were grounded in Europe, the US and Australia, and financial institutions were taken offline. But in many parts of Asia, it was business as usual. Max Walden from the ABC's Asia Pacific Newsroom has been investigating how the region mostly dodged the blue screen of death. Now, Max, welcome to the studio today. Tell us, firstly, how was Asia as a region affected by this outage? Yeah, well, it was basically a non-event. Um, I mean, we monitor social media in places like China and Indonesia pretty closely. And usually with an event like this, you'd see, you know, wall-to-wall -wall kind of people complaining. Um, there was really very little. A few people in Indonesia joking that maybe their uh, edition of Windows was pirated or out of date. Um, but really, it was only countries like Australia, New Zealand, uh, Singapore um, and Hong Kong that were impacted and particular businesses, uh, for example, we saw AirAsia's um, uh, operations disrupted quite significantly, but, but largely it was really a non-event, particularly in China. So what could explain that? Uh, the simple answer is that uh, far fewer businesses in Asia use CrowdStrike's uh, services. So CrowdStrike is really seen as a top tier uh, cyber security provider uh, and their services are quite expensive. So businesses in uh, places like Australia, Singapore, um, you know, they invest in, in, in their services. However, in uh, particularly in China, which very much has its own digital ecosystem, uh, but certainly elsewhere in the region, uh, companies simply don't use use their services. So, for example, AirAsia, which was impacted, of course, is a client of CrowdStrikes. Uh, but broadly speaking, uh, it was only really, say, high risk sorts of businesses like uh, airlines, banks uh, that we saw impacted at all. So largely, it was really just a non-event. Well, they didn't really miss out on anything at all. Max, thanks so much for coming in. Thanks, Yvonne. You're watching Asia Newsweek. Let's take a look at what's making headlines in South Asia. India's government has delivered its first budget since Prime Minister Narendra Modi secured a third term in power. It's allocated around 24 billion Australian dollars to job creation and 32 billion for rural programs. The country is facing a weak job market and economists say land and labour reforms are essential to sustain economic growth. Pakistan police have arrested two aides of former Prime Minister Imran Khan in a raid on his party's office in Islamabad. The Interior Ministry says the spokesperson for carrying out anti-state propaganda and the PTI's global media coordinator have been detained. No word, though, on whether they've been charged, but local media are reporting that one of them have since been released. The ongoing spat between North and South Korea continues. South Korea's military says trash balloons sent from the north are timed to burst and could cause fires. One even reportedly fell on the presidential compound, although no one was hurt. Fights at an airport in Seoul were suspended on Wednesday due to a suspected balloon in the vicinity. Well, Seoul says Pyongyang has sent around 500 balloons laden with rubbish in recent days. It's going to continue boosting its own propaganda, including blaring out K-pop music across the border. After months of rising hostilities between China and the Philippines, the two nations have reached a temporary agreement in an effort to manage maritime disputes and reduce tensions. It comes after repeated fiery clashes between their Coast Guard ships in the disputed South China Sea region. Reporter Bang Xiao explains. It is a temporary um, agreement between Beijing and Manila uh, about allowing the Philippines uh, resupply missions to operate uh, at the second Thomas Shoal, which is at the heart of the disputed waters between China and the Philippines. Um, while both countries confirmed the agreements to jointly manage maritime differences and de-escalate the situation, the actual language they use is actually quite different. 
Beijing claimed that um, you know, with the Philippines informing China in advance, they could allow this to happen, uh, while the Philippines actually firmly opposed these statements, um, which is very interesting because uh, China has used such a diplomatic approach in a, a, a number of um, disputed um, area, including its um, language uh, about the sovereignty dispute with Taiwan in the past. It's interesting that the timing of this arrangement comes at the conclusion of the Communist Party's 20th 3rd plenum, which is a very significant meeting um, that sets the tone for the Chinese economy, military development, national security and foreign policies for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it is clearly that the Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, has been trying to adopt a very different um, foreign policy um, stance, um, particularly uh, in a document which was released by the Chinese government in about 22,000 words. Um, China actually said that um, they want to become the leading role to keep the peace in the region. Australia's federal police say they've disrupted an international sex trafficking ring. A man has been charged over allegedly trafficking a 17-year-old from Indonesia to work in Sydney brothels. The AFP says they've removed at least seven potential victims from sexual exploitation following a lengthy investigation into the syndicate, which was allegedly recruiting young women in Indonesia and bringing them to Australia. A 43-year-old man from Sydney's south faced court charged with trafficking children and police allege he was the Australian ringleader of the operation. In Jakarta, our partners in the Indonesian National Police found multiple per passports of individuals who police will allege had been recruited by the syndicate and were being prepared to be trafficked to Australia. The man was granted strict conditional bail and will face court again in September. The AFP has not ruled out laying further charges in relation to this investigation. Indonesia's president-elect Prabowo Subianto won't be sworn in for another three months, but a pilot for his controversial free lunch program has kicked off this week. The plan to feed primary school students for free was one of the big promises made in his campaign. But just how much will be spent on each meal and how nutritious the food will be is unclear. Previously, the equivalent of one and a half Australian dollars was promised per portion. New estimates suggest only 75 cents per meal could be spent. Kamala Harris is set to take on Donald Trump in the November US election. Across India, people are showing their support. Kamala Harris's mother is from India's southernmost state, Tamil Nadu, and people from her maternal grandfather's town have been praying for her to become US president. We wish for her to win the election and be happy. We are proud of her. In other parts of the country, people are painting posters with her face on it as excitement builds over the prospect of a Western leader with Eastern roots. There's also hope she could strengthen relations between the US and South Asian nations if she does win the upcoming election. The United States is the most powerful country in the world. If they choose a person with Indian origins as their president, then it will be a huge moment for India. Just more headlines now. The South China Sea and violence in Myanmar were top of the agenda as ASEAN leaders met in Laos this week. The foreign ministers discussed efforts to end the crippling conflict in military-run Myanmar, which has developed into a civil war, displacing 2.6 million people. The junta has so far ignored the bloc's plans for peace, including an immediate halt to the violence, negotiations and dialogue by a special envoy and humanitarian aid. Meanwhile, Myanmar's junta chief has taken on the role of acting president after the head of the state was put on medical leave. The announcement follows reports that Mint Swear was suffering from neurological issues and comes a week before the state of emergency must be renewed. The leader of Vietnam's ruling Communist Party has died at the age of 80. Since taking office in 2011, Nguyen Phu Trong had accrued more power than any other modern Vietnamese leader. He worked to tighten party discipline, tackle corruption and helped reform the country's economy, turning it from one of the world's poorest to a middle-income nation in just a generation. 
Now, a classic of Australian cuisine, the humble pie, has been updated with flavours from Cambodia. And the Cambodian-Australian fusion has become a hit, with queues of people wanting to try the award-winning fish amok pie. In Cambodia, we don't have pie, or meat pie. And my first time I tried the meat pie wasn't a great experience at all. And I think that gave me a, a wake up call. So if I have chance to do this, I will do better. We're from Asia, so we love Asian flavor. You know, Thai, Malaysian, Singapore, Vietnamese, Cambodian. So we said, uh, why, why don't we just, you know, try to, to do something that is a bit out of the box. It's a pie, so you can put any feeling in. And then people say we are crazy, <laughs> stupid <laughs> to put something different. Not many people like it. Some of the, the, the dishes are like very spicy, so we need to do a lot of adjustment, do a lot of trial and error, tasting. You know, at least we bring everyone you know, out of their comfort zone. The amok is our favorite food in our family. Mom, mom always cook, and every time we have amok, we always oh very cheerful. We love it so much. Ryan come up with the idea, oh, why can't we just put it into pie? And then it come out with the best result. The last year we win the best pie of Australia and we use the Cambodian flavor, that fish or mock. Now every weekend always get busy. You have to line up in some form to get pie. That fish or mock fly out the door. And sometimes we can't even make enough pie for selling. <laughs> We, we don't just making pie for fun, we, we take it very seriously. We put a lot of hard work, what we call our love in there, dedication. Now everyone, when they come into the store, they, say, they call it a Cambodian pie or Cambodian fish, you know, so that, they're pretty amazing. <laughs> so we feel very proud. Well, from fish amok to omu rice, we're keeping the food theme going. Chef Kichi Kichi is an online sensation and reporter Seni Izona met with the master to find out the secrets to this famous dish. Hello ABC Asia and welcome to Harajuku Gyoza, we are here exploring the Japanese omurice, one of the trickiest omelettes to master. And speaking of masters, we've got the omelette king himself, Motokichi Yukimura, right here in Sydney to show us how it's done. So get inside and take a look. どうやって有名になってますかね。ね、よくわかんないんですけどもね。まあ、ただあの、このオムライスで世界の方々にね、まあ、喜んでもらいたいという思いで一生懸命こう自分が映像作ったやつね、これを楽しくやってました。これが良